I would like to, to acknowledge that um, I'm actually on the land of the Wurundjeri people and I'd like to pay respect to their elders past, present and future. I'd also like to pay respect to the knowledge embedded forever with the, within the Aboriginal custodianship of country and everyone here today is welcome to put in the chat the land that you're, um, that you're currently on. I have great pleasure in introducing Dorinda Tahart and Kazi Fatah, um, who are here today um, donating their time and their, and their knowledge um, for us. And I'm going to let them do the introduction. So Dorinda, did you want to introduce yeah. yourself first? Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, I might share straight away. Okay, so yeah, I'm Dorinda and um, co-presenting this with um, Kazi. It's been really good getting to know him a bit and get to know his project. It's um, He's got some really lovely stuff to share, actually. So I'm from the University of Western Australia. I'm a research associate there in the School of Population Health. And just as an acknowledgement, um, we're on the Wajak Noongar land in Perth. Um, Kazi, do you want to introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. It's really nice to be here. So my name is Kazi Fata. I work as a visual uh, visiting researcher at the University of Melbourne, the Melbourne Centre for Cities. Um, and I also work as at the research and evolution team of the eSafety Commissioner. Thank you. OK, so our um, presentation this morning, we've called it Beyond Textual Boundaries. So using visual methods in sociological, sociological research um, it's actually, you know, the more you dig into it, a very interesting topic. So I hope you will enjoy, we'll share our projects as well, how we use visual methods, and I hope you'll enjoy it. So just really quickly, just briefly talking about theory and aims a little bit. And one thing as you read about visual methodologies is basically this first point. It's really complex and diverse. So many different people use it from so many different disciplines. People use it in different ways. Um, the actual technologies and, and the mediums that they use are so different. Um, but there are a few key points which unite this field. Um, and the first one is that the focus on, well, in brackets, the audiovisual. Um, and also taught that being really clear in your method methods sections about the kinds of media you use, the technologies that you've used. Um, and then also the discussions around ethical issues. Um, and these, depending on your methods and depending on the technologies you've used as to what ethical issues will be raised um, and will be that you, things that you need to think about. So those are the really the things that tie it together. Um, I really like this last point, um, which says that um, uh, the visual methods will uncover what an inter interview cannot do alone. So usually visual methods, they go with an interview. Um, it's not it's not usually, maybe some people use it like that, but it's not usually like a standalone method. Um, but it, it, it's, it will often bring to light things that an in you won't just be able to get from an interview. And that's what's quite exciting about this method. So I'm going to the next slide and Kazi's going to take over from here because that's about his project. Thanks, Dorinda. Uh, I apologize for my voice. I got a nasty cold uh, visiting the Taka um, earlier this week. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, so if you ever uh, if you ever happen to go to the Taka city, there is a chance that you might come across um, some slum-like housing settlements that are designated as Bihari camps. People who live in these camps are known as the Bihari, who are a highly disenfranchised ethnic minority community in Bangladesh. Uh, the Biharis are originally Muslim refugees. Now mostly their descendants who are displaced from their homelands um, during the partition of the Indian subcontinent in the 1940s. So um, nearly 1 million people migrated from uh, the uh, from India to uh, what was then called East Pakistan. And they came from the Indian state of Bihar and as well as several neighboring states. And in East Pakistan, they came to be collectively known as the Bihari. 
Later in 1971, when East Pakistan became independent from Pakistan and emerged as Bangladesh, many of these Biharis rejected the new country and declared themselves as Pakistani citizens and hoped to be repatriated to Pakistan. Um, they faced violence backlash from the local Bengalis who considered them as traitors for their support to the Pakistan army during the war. So to ensure their safety, about half a million Biharis were placed in temporary camps set up by the International Red Cross to, uh, as, as a temporary measure. Pakistan, however, refused to accept them as a Pakistani citizens, saying that these are people from India, so they're Indian migrants, Indian refugees, they're not Pakistanis. So almost overnight, the uh, Biharis became a stateless community, and they have been living in the camps for uh, almost five decades since 1972. Um, they were granted citizenship in Bangladesh in 2008, but around 300,000 Biharis still live in 66 camps scattered across uh, Bangladesh. So my research aimed to explore how the Biharis living in the camps navigate sort of the in-betweenness of various identities and belongingness in the camps and seek, seek to make sense of the ambiguity of everyday experiences of camp life. This draws on my PhD fieldwork in Dhaka, which uh, actually engaged with a somewhat different topic, uh, but some of the findings that emerged from the fieldwork led to this sort of uh, sub-project, which is also the topic of the paper. Uh, we've lost your sound, Kazi. Oh, there we go. can hear you again now. Right. Uh, so, Sorry, do I need to, should I repeat? Where, from what, what point did you lose? Only me? the last sentence, I think. Okay, all right. Um, all right. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please, during that. Um, yeah, so I was saying that uh, this draws on my PhD fieldwork in Dhaka, but that was on a somewhat different topic, but some of the findings that emerged from the fieldwork um, actually led me to this uh, this sort of sub project, which is uh, which is now uh, a the topic of paper that I'm currently writing. So, my I used an ethnographic approach, and um, photography was a key part of it. Um, so, in a sense, uh, I used photographs uh, that are uh, researcher generated photographs within a methodological framework of ethnographic observations. So uh, these photographs were produced by the researcher in the field in the process of data gathering alongside several other tools such as participant observation, informal conversations, interviews, and so on. So as Dorinda mentioned earlier, these are not standalone tools, but working in combination of a, a pursuit of other tools. Uh, I use sort of an open-ended, unstructured approach to taking photographs, and uh, it, it was somewhat inspired by the stream of consciousness approach to writing in literary studies, where I took photos without making a preconceived notion or conscious decision on the subject or topic to be photographed, and instead documented whatever appeared noteworthy, noteworthy in the moment, and I just snapped away. And later, uh, I sort of look at those photographs and they sort of then generated um, questions that I would, you know, take to the um, use to engage the participants. So photography was uh, a tool for one visual net taking and data collection and guiding participant engagement and also for making a uh, sense of the data. There are some similarities between my approach and uh, photo el elicitation, but a major difference is that I did not show the photos to the participants. Instead, use my initial response to the photos, to the contents of the photos, to generate conversations with the participants. And um, I think it's important to note that I was not using photography as a deliberately chosen visual method. So to me, it was just part of the ethnographic approach, just another tool. And I sort of became aware of its significance as a visual um, uh, approach much later when completing my thesis. Um, so in the next few slides, I'll show some examples of the conversations facilitated by the photographs, which then um, led to the findings that informed this research. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please, Dorinda. 
so in the photo that you can see here is a uh, that's the entrance of a Bihari camp, and there's a signboard there which says uh, "Stranded Pakistanis Relief Camp." So the Biharis were granted citizenship in 2008, and everyone living in the camps are now officially Bangladeshi citizen. They have citizenship documents and everything. But when uh, I looked at this photo of uh, of I took this photo and several other entrances of several other camps, and I saw many of them have this sort of signboard saying that they are stranded Pakistanis. And then I started this as a sort of a topic to engage with the, uh, with the people living in the camps, though it was not initially the subject of my research. And, and then a lot of different sorts of conversations came out. And so here are some of the, some of the examples. So one of the Bihari leaders was telling me that in Bangladesh, we are stranded Pakistanis. But to the outside world, we are refugees. You understand refugees, right? It means people who don't have a country. And then someone else was saying, I prefer if the government just dumped me in Pakistan. Uh, it would have been better to die there staying here uh, than staying here like this. And then another person was saying that everyone in the camps has voter ID cards now. They are no longer standard Pakistanis. Everyone is Bangladeshis. So these accounts often reveal traces of a sense of in-betweenness in their everyday construction of uh, individual and collective identity. Many Biharis saw themselves as Bangladeshi citizens and openly expressed their reluctance to be associated with the Pakistani identity. But many thought that by becoming Pakistani Bangladeshi citizens, they have lost any prospect ever of repatriation of Pakistan. So these competing narratives kept appearing in the conversations of the of the camp uh, residents. And sometimes in the same conversation, some residents self-identified both as a refugee and a, and a citizen. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please, Dorinda. Uh, then this is another photo that I took when uh, walking through the camp. And I don't remember when I took these photos, but when I um, came back home and was looking at this photo, one thing that struck to me is that um, the text in the photo, there uh, at the top there is Arabic text, text and then um, in the middle those are all Urdu texts, but in the, in the, at the bottom the pronunciations are written in Bangla, and I found this very interesting because uh, there is a lot of talk going on around uh, particularly among educated Biharis to present themselves as a Urdu speaking community rather than a Bihari community. Um, so I then started use this sort of as a starting point to probe around the topic. And then these are some of the responses that came up. So one of the prominent Bihari rights activists uh, so were sort of saying that we all speak Urdu. So as a linguistic minority, that's the more appropriate term for us. But then a lot of other people are saying, like when I asked them about the language, they're saying we speak Hindi, not Urdu. And many people are saying that after living in the camp for so many years, it's just a mix of Urdu, Hindi, Bengali. So they don't feel that, that they can be identified as Urdu speaking minority. And the Bangla writings are there because as one person said, our children go to Bengali medium schools, they can't read or write Urdu but they know how to read or write Bengali. And then other, some, there are some other people saying that, uh, uh, you know, we don't identify it as a Urdu speaking community because that makes us, initially makes us different and then become targets of discrimination. So uh, if you could please go to the next slide, Dorinda. So uh, then, in this slide, there are two photos, the left one of a wall painting. And I, when I saw this photo and asked people about what this, and I learned that traditionally, this is a photo of a marching band, which used to be a key part of Bihari weddings, but they don't bring in marching bands anymore. As one person said that no one brings in marching bands for weddings anymore, because that immediately makes it identifiable as a Bihari wedding. People want to avoid that, but then, the picture on the right is a uh, is a photo that I took during a festival, which is one of the major festivals, and where there are massive processions come out of the camps and move through all over the city. And then I thought, why is it different? Where you know they are 
proclaiming their Bihari identity, proudly showing our Bihari identity. And then one of the accounts, uh, one of the local leaders are telling me that, very proudly saying that Muslims in India and Pakistan built Tajias too. Tajias are a sort of replica of the tomb of a religious leader that they carry through the positions. Uh, so, but when people see our Muharram, they know that's that's how the Biharis do it, and and so that sort of uh, helped me to frame my initial question around uh, exploring their initial uh, their the in betweenness of identities and think about not who the Bihari are, but when is the Bihari. That is also very important to us because their are instances where they want to avoid being identified as a Bihari, but there are instances where they want to be portrayed as a Bihari and that embracing that that identity. So uh, for me, these findings show that being neither Biharis, neither refugees anymore, or fully accepted or integrated in the citizenry, Bihari is sort of the, the way they sort of remain between and between these identities, and and I think. The, these photographs played a key role in sort of guiding me to explore these topics and understanding understanding these issues uh, sort of in a more uh, grounded way. Uh, I will stop there. I think I have taken a lot of time and uh, I'll hand over to Dorinda. Dorinda, over to you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thanks, Kazi. I think you're right on time there. I think you did a great job. Um, so my project is very different. So you're all going to have to do a massive jump here. Um, and the, because the title of my project was Post-Abortion Narratives Shared by Perth Women, Personal Decision-Making as Embedded Social Practice. So um, what I was, my project was really interested in was the whole question of decision-making. And the reason why I was interested in this is because very often um, an abortion decision is presented as this personal decision that um, the woman will make a loan, right? And I was just really intrigued by this and just wanted to see um, how how it actually happened in practice, right? And so I, I was investigating questions of, you know, autonomy, agency, networking, those kinds of things and, and how that played out in this particular moment of the abortion decision, right? And, and I, I guess to be clear, it's not like, you can then say that this was their practice with all decisions it was that we really focused on this one decision and looking at who was around them who was supporting them who did they get information from um, all of that sort of thing only for that particular decision um, what's interesting about my project as compared to Kazi's as well is he started with um, the, the visuals so he took the photographs and then they led to the questions that he was asking um, but my for me the visual came at the end so I um elicited the narrative first um, and they and we spent quite well however long it took for them to tell me their narrative and then after that we went to um, and I'll show you some examples later we went to a drawing exercise where we where I gave them a blank piece of paper and then they mapped out the the experience of making that decision and um, so mine was more that it was this co-construction exercise where they had told me the narrative and then kind of summarized it. I prompted questions. Sometimes if um, they had mentioned something in their narrative, I would remind them like, you know, you had mentioned, say, your mum. Um, and do you want to put that in the picture or not? You know, so those kinds of things. So it was a, it, it's where my methods came, my visual methods came at the end. And um, that's just kind of interesting. So I'll just show you some examples now. Um, so this was a lady who she was really strong on that her decision was her own decision, um, which, you know, does fit the general understanding that it is an individual decision. And so you can see in her picture that she put herself in there right in the middle, um, basically took up almost the whole of the paper. Um, you got the big circle here. Um, she was quite grudging, actually, about putting her husband in the corner here. Notice he's smaller. Um, and, yeah, it was a bit like, well, all right, fine, I'll put him in because he was part of the decision. Um, this lady did mention her mum and some friends, and I did remind her of that, but she was quite strong about like, no, she did not want to put them on the paper um, in, on this uh, visual, because really they were just um, a bit of a sounding board. They gave her uh, material or you know physical support in some ways, but when it came to this decision, they were not really part of the decision. 
Um, so the way we way we did this exercise was that I gave, like I said, I gave him the blank paper um, and first started with me, put yourself on there somewhere. And then we talked about the people that she had mentioned in the narratives. I've got the two different colors here. Um, I'm going to, in this presentation, I'm going to focus on the people that, which is the one color. But the other part of the exercise was that um, I asked them also to map out the uh, different ideas that we had talked about and we used a different color for that, right? So the different ideas were things around um, motherhood, of things around careers, their understandings of these things and how important they were. So the way the exercise worked was if that they were really important, they'd put them closer to themselves. But if it was less important, then they'd sort of like push it out. But of course there was no scale. It was all free, free form. So, yeah, so this idea here that, you know, she thought that, you know, having an abortion was an acceptable idea in society. So that was her general base idea. Um, yeah, but anyway, I won't talk about the ideas too much, um, mostly to be talking about the people on, on the drawings. So the next one, um, as you can see, is very different. Uh, this uh, participant, she actually had an abortion because she it was a disability abortion. Um, yeah, so she had been diagnosed with a trisomy 18 pregnancy, which is when, if I get my facts right, you have three chromosomes at number 18 um, rather than the regular two. Um, and it causes many disabilities, many kinds of disabilities. It's obviously not all the same. And generally, the um, it's not considered viable. Um, so generally, the baby dies before birth and otherwise very soon after. Um, so, you know, this was quite traumatic for her. But what's very interesting about this is that because it was a very medical diagnosis, um, she in the middle here, she's got the two, the three of them as the key decision makers. She's got me and she's got then her husband and she's got the obstetrician. Um, now I have my, here we go. My, so you've got the three in the middle here. I don't know if you can see my cursor. Um, and also that they're equidistant, right? So they, they are equally um, part of the decision making process. And um, that did come out in her narrative as well. Um, she was very reliant on medical information, very much that like it was a cut and dried case. The doctors all said this, therefore that was the decision. Um, and then the other people who were in her network are all in this equidistant circle around her. So she's got mum, dad, she's got brothers and sisters, she's got in-laws, she's got friends. And oops, sorry, didn't mean to do that. Um, and so, yeah, she um, she was quite clear that they were all there for her. They were all supported, but it wasn't really like they inputted in the decision and giving information, you know, because it was a very medical um, diagnosis and a medical um, issue. It was more that they were surrounding her with that care rather than being part of the decision making process. Um, so I particularly find the three in the middle here quite interesting. Um, okay, so then the, this is my last example. Um, and again, started with me in the middle there. It was actually quite interesting because I said, yeah, just, just write me in the, in, 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 I didn't actually didn't specify to put them in the middle because I was actually curious about whether they would put themselves in the middle of the circle, in the middle of the paper, or whether they, how they would visualize themselves in this decision-making process. Were they the most important ones? So I actually specifically did not say put yourself in the middle. I said put yourself somewhere on the paper. And usually it was in the middle. Um, yeah, and so, and she then she was like, oh, I wanted to draw a stick person. So she did. Um, anyway, so what's interesting about this one is that in the corner here, you have her mum who was living interstate at the time and really just not part of her. So she acknowledged the relationship, but that there was no input into the decision. Um, she was closer to her nan because I believe she was, no, she was not living with her at the time because she's got her housemate here. But her nan, she's drew tears because she said that her nan was very upset about the whole experience and the whole decision, et cetera. Um, but particularly what's interesting is that she put the partner as far away as she could from herself um, on the paper um, because this, this relationship was, it was a very new relationship. She'd known him for about four weeks and then actually broke up before she had found out she was pregnant but then when she found out she was pregnant then he was actually quite forceful in wanting to um get this relationship going somehow some somewhere and then because she was pregnant it was like oh you know we can do something we can make a relationship we can we can get somewhere with this 
Um, but she really did not want that. And so you got the double-headed arrow here. And I really felt that um, her deciding to have an abortion was to create that buffer between the two of them. And you, that's why she's actually positioned it as well, um, not bringing someone into my life. Um, Recognising that if even if she didn't stay with this person, by having a child with that person, she would automatically be... Um, tied for life with you know parental agreements or whatever it might be there would always be that connection and she just really really didn't want that and so yeah you, I just thought the use of the double-headed arrow was interesting there just creating that buffer between um the two people and then just as a last little note the love heart here where she you know showed appreciation for her housemate who at the time um, had given her quite a bit of um, support so I believe those are just my three examples and um, we'll talk quickly about some ethical concerns that we've um, felt um, during and had to think about while we were doing our projects. Um, Kazi's going to take the lead on this, and then I'll just mention a point as well. Regarding the ethical um, issues, so uh, one thing is that, uh, that there are lots of debates around uh, representation or presentation versus interpretation when you're using photographs. Um, but what uh, particularly um, strikes me uh, when working with, when I use photographs to engage with these conversations around uh, the Bihari community, when people saw me taking photographs, a lot of people were asking me to take photos of particular things. So it's a, like a dilapidated um, a, a community toilet, which is in a really bad situation. These buildings are the the building where they live in, these are very uh, risky, very like disaster waiting to happen on any second, at any second. And people would often ask me to take those photos and which I was not very comfortable with uh, because of one reason, that's the, that's the type of photos you will always see if you, you know, if you, if you Google for photos of Bihari camps and you'll see all these photos and then portrayals of poverty and, and all those things and and that i didn't want to do because i was more one thing is that uh, i was taking photographs for a different purpose and a different approach but also i didn't want to position them as a as a community that is so much uh, you know framed in terms of underdevelopment po poverty crime and, and lots of the images that are available, that are out there, those sort of contribute to um, territorial stigmatization, uh, neighborhood blaming and, and, and things like that. Uh, uh, lots of uh, stigmatization and, and criminalization of their poverty and things like that. So, so that's a dilemma where, where people are telling me, you're coming from a research institute taking photos let's take these photos because we think this is very important for you to show to the world. But then that I'm not at all comfortable with that thing. And, and then I actually took, had to take a lot of those photos, but which I don't show anywhere. And then again, that becomes an ethical dilemma for me. And so, so that's, um, that's where I think it's, it's very uh, in, important to sort of come at a, at a sense of uh, ethics in context where uh, it's very much uh, understood coming to a, a negotiation of what the participants want and what your research focus is, but protecting the, the sort of uh, ensuring the dignity. Um, and then the other thing is around anonymity. Um, so uh, it's, it's very difficult to, like when I'm particularly photographing someone and people are consenting, saying, yes, they're happy to for me to take their photos and use there somewhere. But then in the whole research, I'm saying that I'm going to uh, ensure people's anonymity and confidentiality. So how to, how to, you know, how to balance that, how to make sure that I can use the photographs and I can use the, the sort of ensure the anonymity and confidentiality and things like that. And often uh, I talk to people uh, like other researchers and I was often advised to use a sort of journalistic approach where the journalists uh, 
often take photos in the public place and take in that given that if you're taking someone in a public space and not particularly focusing on someone then it's okay to take their photos and things like that so again it's it's sort of coming to terms with a sense of what you feel is right what the ethical requirements want and then also what you know about you know protecting the identity and confidentiality or our interest of the, of the research participants and another thing around sorry going back to the ethics of context another point i'd like to quickly add is that um, when when taking photographs in the camp one thing i noticed is that people in general were okay with taking photographs but they were also very interested in knowing how the photos will be used and then one of the key concerns was that there's they're saying that people come there journalists go to the camps take photos and then use these photos to criminalize their camps saying that okay see here are all the criminals live see how they live and they they sort of pollute the environment of the city so the purpose of the photos how they will be used that i saw that it was very important among many of the residents in the camp rather than so come in you're welcome to take photos but tell us how you're going to use that and, and that's how, that's i thought something uh, not only for this research but for any research i think that's something very important to remember to inform the participants how i'm going to take the photos not just you know taking their consent that's that's not probably enough uh, over to you dorinda yep thank you um, I guess my point here, it, it follows on from Kazi's point about the anonymity and it's, you know, this is a concern that as researchers we always have and we always have to think about is, you know, protecting the identity of um, the participants. In the case of where, like I had done drawings with them, um, they were creators, right, and co-creators of the work. Um, and what uh, um, the drawings that we did, it poses a particular dilemma i suppose and and not just something that you need to think about is that because they wrote on the paper handwriting is always very individualistic very uh, particular to that person right and so um i guess i i use them obviously as i am um, have um done in in this presentation now um so i do what i can to uh, um de-identify you know taking the names off if the um i when i ask them to draw i always ask ask them to um you know refer to brother sister or something like that as opposed to um um putting down names or as in the one drawing they did initials um if they did accidentally put names on there then i would um edit that with a uh, you know covering it with a text box um so yeah just um yeah taking that extra precaution i guess when when you have get that you have this creation the drawing like that i guess you just need to take that extra step of thinking about how are you going to protect the people who made it um and and um using that in a respectful way and and assuring that that de-identification process yeah so it's an extra thing to think about, really. And I think Kazi's taking this one. Uh, yeah, thanks, Dorinda. So um, after uh, after sort of I became in my while writing the thesis about this sort of um, the the visual aspect of the research, and then I started exploring uh, about you know. Uh, developing research outputs that are largely visually led. And then I found that there are many journals, uh, good journals, visual studies, visual anthropology review, and, and journals like that, who sort of publish visually led papers where it's, you know, mostly visuals driven. You get, you put in any number of visuals, but a very small amount of text, maybe 1,000 to 2,000 words. and those are sort of a different sort of more creative research outputs. And then obviously I try to pursue that. And some of the things that I faced is that uh, one is the peer review process gets really tricky. So it happened to me several times where the peer reviewers were treating these 
visual essays or, or, or visual, visually driven work as a traditional research work and they were giving feedback that were not at all relevant. And then the editor coming to me saying that, ignore the reviewers, this is what you should address. And, and so that happened twice with me. But then again, it's often like people giving, uh, reviewers giving comments like that, you need to take the photo from this angle, not that angle, and which is very absurd and things like that. Or crop the photo in it this way, don't show this in the photo, don't do this and don't that, do that, things like that. Or sometimes the, the, the comments just, just don't uh, sort of uh, do justice at all to this sort of creative visually led work where the research that the reviewers would expect more of a you know a description of the of the data in a more traditional form not you know you present images and you say okay this is my data and that often a lot of the reviewers find difficult to engage with uh, so that's one of the one of the challenges. Another challenge is, is often, uh, I was told several times that, so I, 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 ha I have a few uh, visual lists published and I have a few under review. And then I often, I'm being told that, okay, this is not a full length research article or this is not a proper, proper research article because this is just images and you just wrote two or three paragraphs. So, so I guess what I'm saying is that in the in the sort of hierarchy of research outputs, qualitative research, ethnographic research, always, you know, are seen is is not as good as quantitative research, and then visual research, it's like something at the bottom. It it's always sort of looked down upon, and so what happens is that you get very little engagement. With the, with the publications, people don't tend to cite those. A lot of the journals uh, that have a major focus on publishing visually led work, they have a very low impact factor as well. So all these things sort of uh, create challenges. But when you write, at least from my experience, when I'm writing a visually driven work, a visual essay, it's no less work than preparing a, a sort of full-length research article, I guess at some at times even more so because I'm always concerned about how people are going to interpret the visuals because it's it's very very much open to uh, subjective interpretation and and so same with the camp photos and uh, there was a, a photo of a of a of a father with his child on his shoulder carrying a sword, a playing sword. And when I look at these photos, I can immediately think that a lot of people can relate these photos about with, um, you know, those stereotypes of terrorism, the Muslim terrorists, the, the child Ill, 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 with the sword and they sort of, you know, all these things and the, the dress ups and all, all these things. So it's very much, uh, time consuming in terms of how you curate the photos and how you sort of um, frame the whole thing, how you create the narrative in a way that that sort of can not um, limit the interpretation to a particular way. So so these are some of the, uh, I guess, practical challenges that, uh, that I have faced in focusing on in trying to get out uh, get uh, you know visually let work out in the in the academic world so I guess that's all from me uh, over to you Dorinda thank you um so yeah I didn't have anything to add um what he said <laughs> was great so that's why I haven't spoken to that slide at all but yeah um, I I really understand what he what he what Kazi was saying there so yeah just in conclusion there I guess um the first point I've got here is flexibility regarding starting points. Like, you know, Kazi started with the visuals. I um, did the narrative first and then we did the visuals. Um, so just, you know, and there's probably other approaches as well. Um, so if you want to do visual, just to really explore what will work best for your project. Um, also regarding the starting points and being flexible in that. Um, and 
and just being uh, aware that the different perspectives that uh, will, that visuals will give. So, you know, it allows you to um, either ask different questions. That's what was very clear from Kazi's presentation. Um, and also, like in, in, in my case, the visuals were more of a summary. So it sort of like heightened what was important. At times, actually, what happened as well is that the participant also commented made a sort of evaluated comment like oh I never really realized that you know something like that which came to view through both the narrative and then also through the the visual um yeah so that's uh, an interesting thing to think about if you want to use visuals and also it's um a bit of a plus I think um and it, it, it allows for different conversations so it really opens up that that access a bit of a repeat there so I'm just going to show you our references. Um, so these two here um, are the what actually sparked this presentation, actually, because we uh, published these these two articles. So mine is actually in the handbook, and it really gives you a much more in depth um, explanation of what was what we what I did. So and why I did it, right? So it's really um, it talks about the theory behind it and the, and the theory that I was examining, examining, which is the relational autonomy, and then my method, and it gives you a, a very clear um, outline of what exactly I did, and then uh, this one here by Kazi is um, an, a visual uh, uh, article that he did get published, um, and yeah, I have seen it, and it does have a lot of um, visuals in there, which is great. So yeah, I, th I believe that's all from us, yes. Um, I will stop sharing now and we can go over to some questions if anyone has questions. Thank you so much, Dorinda and Kazi. That was fantastic. I, I thought that the bit that struck me was that hierarchy of value. It's just, I mean, it's, I'm, I'm not surprised, but it still blows my mind. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so hopefully the more people do it, uh, the greater the value will become. Yep. Now, um, if anyone has a question, would you like to pop your hand up or you can even, there's a new message there, is that? So is that okay, Sally? That's more than fine. We can hear you. Thank you. Um, firstly, thank you to Dorinda and Kazi for two really great presentations. So much to think about and uh, it's just so interesting. So thank you very much. I have I have quite a lot of questions, but I think no, don't be greedy. You've just got a few others and members of the audience. So um, if there was time afterwards, I'm happy to raise the others. But the one I was thinking of is just the practical thing, given all the complexities you're explaining about. Um, I was thinking when Kazi was talking initially about this, but then also in regard to with your work too, Dorinda. How do you get that all through? Or what, how did you succeed in getting all that okayed in your ethics applications? Because it seems to me there's lots of subtleties there and possibilities and different interpretations, different uses and misuses of photographic and visual material, which I don't know ethics committees or the ethics application forms necessarily allow you to capture all those nuances and explain the purpose and how you're going to use things and when you're actually in the field, et cetera, et cetera. So I wondered if you could give us some insights into help how you manage to get your ethics applications through with all those complexities. Thank you. Kazi, you want to go first? Um, sure. Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. And uh, so for me, uh, what worked is that uh, I, I actually struggled a lot finding like justifications or looking at other theses and trying to sort of um, get that approval but ultimately what I did is that um, follow some advice given to me around that journalistic uh, using journalistic ethics and which somehow the ethics committee approved so I, I mentioned that uh, I'm going to use um, like one is that not avoid trying to showing close-ups of people and and things like that so often I would try to photograph people from the back or in a way that doesn't sort of identify them clearly. Uh, then the other thing was, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, about uh, sort of the dignity. And, and so and also these are all in addition to, you know, informed consent, informing people about the use of the, the photos and things like that. 
and then um, but when you're doing an ethnographic research so for example i spend a lot of time just sitting in tea stalls in the camp watching people you know looking at what's going on having very informal conversations with people and taking random photos and it's not really possible to sort of um, ask permission for sometimes i don't even in many photos i realized there were people where i didn't even notice that there were people when i was taking those photos so and and so um, for me what helped was uh, explaining in the ethics application about that uh, I, I got that from somewhere uh, like the actual framing of it uh, around how the journalists use the their photo photographic ethics in when taking photos in public spaces and i guess i was a bit lucky that the ethics committee did not you know make it more complicated and maybe I'll just speak to that as well as like for myself as well um it actually was not a difficult process which you know as we're talking now and as you raise your question I, I actually think is actually a little bit amazing um the way I I did frame it at the time was that I was leaping off the method which you know is a very common method and that is like with the social network analysis right and it's actually really common to get people to map out their um their networks so maybe the ethics committee knew about that but maybe less about like um what you know what the end end result was and and so they didn't raise too many questions um because i had deliberately um changed the the regular method of the social network analysis um a little bit which i explained completely i think also and um, kazi and i talked a little bit about this as we we're preparing this um I think as well is that for ourselves, for me anyway, is where we um, actually didn't really fully appreciate the the power of the visual until we had done it and we're looking at, looking back at it, if you know what I mean. And that's what's actually really made us more more excited about visual methods than um, at the beginning. And you know when you're you're, you're uh, designing your project and you're handing in your ethics, it wasn't uh, we were didn't quite realize how good it was going to be if you know what I mean and um but then also the the ethical dilemmas as well um probably didn't really fully realize I didn't anyway um the the ethics that could come with that and I suppose this also then reflects on like you know ethics is a good is a process and it's a good one but it's a part of the puzzle and so as an ethical researcher it actually requires more thinking than just getting the ethics passed. And I, and I suppose it speaks to that as well, that how are you going to be as an ethical researcher? And um, and that's what I really liked in Kazi's presentation, where he really brought out like the whole representation and that dilemma of what do you show, what don't you show, those kinds of questions, which, which you can't just say, yeah, I've got ethics, therefore, yeah. And it raises that question as well. Thank you. Um, this is uh, one for you, Dorinda. I was thinking as you were talking, um, I just wondered if you encountered any kind of resistance from your participants along the lines of, oh, I'm not very good at drawing. A bit like if you ask someone to sing and they say, oh, I'm tone deaf, I couldn't possibly do that. And did you encounter that? And and, what, um, and if so, what strategy did you use to reassure people you weren't an art teacher assessing their work? <laughs> Yeah, good question. Um, I actually found that I didn't really, no, I didn't get resistance to ask, uh, just to be quick in my answer, I did not get resistance to the drawing. I actually did get that a little bit with um, narratives because I would uh, say, oh, you know, just tell me the story of what happened, you know, um, which, you know, you think is a bit of a soft sort of a question, right? And then it'd be like, oh, I'm not a very good storyteller, so I'll try, but, you know, I'll, you know I actually got more resistance there than I did with the with the drawing. It could be because I did do it step by step. So I didn't say, um, you know, can you draw out your network? Um, so it could be that's like, oh, here, I'm giving you, giving you this paper. This is the general thing of what we're going to do. But can you, you know, just start by putting yourself on the paper? And it could be because of that. Um, just thinking about the answer now. Yeah. Thank you. Lucinda, it looks like the floor is yours again. Did you have another question? I did actually, yes. <laughs> I feel very <laughs> fire away. 
it's good because other people can learn from the from the answers that Dorinda and Kazi give as well. So thank you to our speakers. So this one was for Kazi. I was thinking as you were talking about the identity and the in betweenness. Um, oh, and and talking about say the children are going to Bengali, if I'm saying correctly, you know, correctly schools. I'm wondering if there's um, if you found. Well, there's a few things, um, I suppose, really. I was thinking to what extent uh, your um, photography that you did commented on particularly the status of the way children felt about their in-betweenness. Because I suppose I was thinking, as you were talking, might it be the case that over a number of generations, that's that in-betweenness is the identity for the younger people growing up in those camps. And so... Um, the, the refugee settings. So I was, yes, thinking, I suppose, two things. Can you comment about if, if there was particular differences there in regard to children's sense of identity and in between this, and to what extent the photography was in any way useful in that regard? Mm. Uh, that's it. That's that's. Those are very interesting questions, Lucinda. Thank you for that. So uh, about children. So I was uh, really concerned about not taking photos of any children. So that's, I guess, um, something that uh, I was also not uh, comfortable with. So I deliberately did not photograph any children. And, and so I guess I could not use that to probe around that. But then um, in the conversations, I did see a sort of generational uh, difference in terms of how people from different generations frame their identities or where they sort of locate them. And obviously, people who were, I guess, uh, the older the people were, they were more sort of uh, prone to identifying themselves as stranded Pakistanis or sort of longing for Pakistan. But this was very different among, uh, so I, I did two focus groups with uh, people who were um, around the age of 18, 19, 20. And they, these, these young people are very much uh, they distanced themselves from the idea of Pakistan and they were saying like, we have never been to Pakistan. We have no idea what that country is about. Like they have, they were born in the camp. They have been in Bangladesh all along. And many of those actually spoke fluent Bengali. So, and they look like Bengali. So you don't know that they are Biharis unless they say, that they tell you that they live in the camps. And a lot of them were actually, so the older people were more, their work and everything were more centered around the camp. But these younger people for their education, for their work, they're more spread out in the city. So they have more, I guess, engagement with the Bengali community. And, and so that, that divide is very much clear where younger people were very much against the idea of thinking about themselves as stranded Pakistanis or Indian refugees or having to do with any of those things and very proudly saying that I guess uh, they have more stability in, in that sense of thinking themselves as Bangladeshi citizens, whereas the older people were not at all stable in, in sort of, you know, they would often go between these identities saying, I'm a stranded Pakistani. We've lost your sound. <laughs> Just the last sentence again. So there you go. You hear me now? Yeah. So I was saying that the among the older people, those those sort of in betweenness were more prominent. So they would just sort of go between these identities, sometimes saying I'm a standard Pakistani, sometimes saying I'm a refugee. But sometimes, like if they they don't get access to government services, then they would say, "I'm a Bangladeshi citizen. I have my national ID cards and everything." So, so I saw the struggle in a way uh, on a different level among the sort of people who have been living in the camps. Uh, I guess the, the older people who are sort of trying to come to a sense of uh, that sort of stability in terms of their identities, where it was not the case for younger people. Thank you, Kelsey. That's very interesting. We've got time for one uh, one more quick one, which has been put in the chat 
by Vanessa. So thank you, Vanessa. And I think it's an interesting one. They're wondering if digital ethnography as a methodology includes using existing images. And what would you say about using existing images? That's for either of you. Yep. Um, I actually think Kazi should answer this one more than me. Um, the thing is, I just want to type something in the chat of a reference, which I think would be really good. And that has to do with what Kazi was talking about before um, about representation. And so I'll put that in the chat, but I think maybe Kazi's more to speak to this one. Yeah, sure, happy to, <laughs> to do that. So I think, of course, yeah, existing images can be um, part of uh, uh, and. We've lost you again, Kazi. Of course, that can be a very good source of uh, data. And if you're using digital ethnography, so existing images can be a source of that. And so, for example, um, in in one of the uh, families I was talking to, they were showing me photos of of their families, people who were in India and all those things. And at that time, I thought, OK, this is very interesting. But uh, I didn't take many photos or I didn't you know, document those. But then I saw several other papers published, which sort of uses that uh, engaging with people, but then using existing images, family photos, and things like that. And that can be a very rich source of very uh, it's an incredible source of data. That's taken us right to 1.30. That's amazing. <laughs> well done, both of you. Um, on behalf of everyone here today and also on behalf of Taza, thank you, Dorinda and Kazi, for donating your time and your experience and your knowledge um, and for allowing us to record this as well. That's very generous of you. Um, there'll be... The recording will be a link to that will be put in next week's newsletter. So thank you. And I, ho I hope you feel better soon, Kazi.